Good afternoon. My name is Mark Lyson. I'm the director of the Program on the Global Environment and the interim director of the Center for International Studies at the University of Chicago. On behalf of ourselves and our partner and co-sponsor today, the Field Museum, we are very pleased to welcome you this afternoon to Fractured, a public discussion on fracking in the environment. This is the inaugural event of Global Energies, a year-long series that's an inquiry into the ecology, science, and politics of energy in the 21st century, organized by the University of Chicago Center for International Studies and the Program on the Global Environment. Please visit cis.uchicago.edu for more information. As concerns about the viability of conventional energy sources grow, new technologies and new sources of production loom large in our energy future. By any measure, horizontal drilling and hydraulic fracturing, or fracking, are important if unconventional resource extraction techniques with the potential to transform our energy landscape. As with any transformative moment, however, these technologies come with controversy and with consequences. Today, we are very pleased to be able to explore these issues with a distinguished panel of scholars and policymakers. Before I introduce them, however, um, let me just lay out the schedule for the presentations. Each of our five invited panelists will have just 15 minutes to present their work. These presentations will be followed by an opportunity for questions from the audience and a panel-wide discussion. We ask that you hold your questions until the end of the presentations. We also ask that you keep your questions brief, as our time here today is very limited. Finally, we ask that you speak into one of the two microphones that will be in these two aisles um, at the time of the Q&A. Okay. Um, we very, very much appreciate your patience today. Okay. Now, let me introduce our panelists in the order that they will be speaking. First, Terry Evans, photographer of Fractured, North Dakota's oil boom, which is currently on exhibit here at the Field Museum. Terry will be followed by Margaret McDonald, the Principal Environmental Systems Engineer at Argonne National Laboratory. Next, we will hear from Rob Jackson, the Nicholas Professor of Global Environmental Change at Duke University's Nicholas School of the Environment. Then Alika Wally, Curator in the Field Museum's Anthropology Department. And finally, Mike Ziri, legislative liaison at the Illinois EPA. Please join me in welcoming our panel today. Good afternoon. My partner, Elizabeth Farnsworth, writer, and I decided that we wanted to explore the North Dakota oil boom, um, in part because uh, she grew up in Kansas and was interested in the prairie, and in part because all of my work as an artist photographer has been connected and informed in some way uh, by the prairies and the plains. And so, we headed out to North Dakota. She lives in Berkeley now and uh, regrets that she can't be here today. We met up in Minot, North Dakota and headed west to the Williston Basin, to the Bakken Range where the oil boom is occurring. Now, you may wonder, what does this have to do with us? This is North Dakota. Um, after seven trips there, uh, I think it has everything to do with us. And, uh, and I think you'll um, begin to see that as, as I move through the stories of some of the people there. And as we think about fracking coming to Illinois and coming to so many places and already 
um, established in so many places all over the world. So we started out in, um, uh, in the Williston area, but uh, all of this is in the Upper Missouri, um, the Upper Missouri landscape, the, the historical and storied landscape of Lewis and Clark and of the Mandan Indians and of uh, Max Millen and Carl Bodmer who came there to paint landscape. And so, um, so this, this is that landscape. The very first day, uh, we met Scott Davis. Scott and his brother Steve are ranchers. Um, they raise Angus beef, and um, Elizabeth had simply found his name on the internet and called him up and said, would you please talk to us? And he was right off of Highway 2 at the tiny uh, town of White Earth. His ranch was just uh, on the edge of the town. So, uh, so we stopped there. And within an hour of, or within a couple of hours of arriving in North Dakota, um, Scott took us to this, um, this oil pad on his prairie. And he showed it to us, and they had just finished fracking this pad. And um, you see the oil pumping unit in the middle of it, um, preparing to pump oil. And there were all the trucks still there, all the tanks still there. And we looked at it. Uh, it was our first experience to see an oil pad up close. And Scott said, um, the thing that breaks my heart is that this oil pad is on Virgin Prairie. And that broke my heart, too. It broke my heart even though I didn't know him because I know what Virgin Prairie is and I know how rare it is and I know how rich it is. And um, so I said, well, can we walk on it? And he said, well, sure, but wouldn't you like to see some white horses? And um, we said, sure. And so he took us around the bend and there were, um, there were 12 Appaloosa horses with this little um, foal uh, among them. And this is an aerial view of those same white horses. And I said, well, Scott, why do you have these horses? Do you ride them? And he said, uh, no, my hip bothers me. I can't ride them. But I just think they're beautiful. That's OK, isn't it? So of course, he had won my heart already. Um, this connection to beauty and this heartbreak over the prairie. Um, but the story is more complicated than that. The reason that uh, the oil company could frack this land without his permission is because he didn't own the surface rights. I mean, he did own the surface rights. He didn't own the mineral rights. He owned a, a very small portion, but not enough to prevent the oil company from coming in and claiming uh, what was theirs. So uh, I was very curious about this, this piece of landscape. So the next time we came, which was in August, that, was, that first trip was in uh, late May, early June of 2011. We came back again in August, and I had invited uh, Alexei Shipanov, a botanist from Minot State University, uh, to come and look at this piece of land and tell us what he thought about it. And within an hour, he had collected uh, around 60 different species of native plants. It was a very rich and per fertile, um, fertile prairie. This is um, Scott's son Kevin's front porch. Um, Kevin is one of three of Scott's adult children who uh, live in the area. So here is where the complicated part comes in. So Scott was very upset about the oil pad on the prairie because he loves it. He loves that landscape and they happened to put the pad on the very piece of land which was his family's favorite place to have picnics. But his children grew up, they went off to college, and then they couldn't find jobs in North Dakota. Uh, they came back in, in the midst of the oil boom, and they all work for oil companies now. They, they all work for Hess Oil Company. 
And so Kevin is building his house on his father's land, on some of that ranch land. This is the front porch looking out over the White Earth Valley. And, uh, and his other children work there too. So Scott has this um, dilemma, this, this uh, conflicted situation of having this prairie uh, broken and ruined and yet having his children here, his adult children living here with him and now his grandchildren all on his land and all because of oil. Um, I think this is the kind of conflict that many of us find in our lives when we think about energy use and when we think about what we want to do about it and how we want to live. This is Scott's daughter, um, uh, Sarah Jo, and, uh, and her daughter, Ayla. So I'm just showing you a few members of the Davis family. Uh, but I wanted to show you this one of Ayla because it is her life that will be more affected than, uh, than any others in the family. It is her life and her, now she has a little brother. Um, she has two cousins now too, all, all who have been born since our first trip there. So I'm taking you now to the surrounding area. Um, this is a waste dump. Um, south uh, in between Tioga and Newtown. Tioga is, is not far from uh, the White Earth Valley uh, where the Davis family lives. Um, this is a regional waste dump for, um, for waste from, from new pads that have been drilled. Um, there are about 6,000 oil pads in the Williston Basin right now with a goal to make 50,000, 50,000. Um, everything has changed. Everything has changed on the landscape there. As Scott Davis says, um, our lives as we knew, knew them are over. They will never be the same again. And one of the things that has changed is just the enormous amount of traffic and dust and new roads. But here are people who have come, people who have come to North Dakota for jobs. Um, this is another dilemma. The oil boom provides um, many, many, many jobs. Thousands of people have come there. Um, boom is exactly the right word. And this, uh, this is uh, Freddie, who is from Uruguay. He's a directional driller. He controls the drilling from a computer um, above ground. Um, this, is, um, this is Elena. Elena Roska from uh, Moldova, who was there on a three-month uh, work permit and was um, cleaning motel rooms. This is Dutch, who came from uh, Arizona because he thought there might be some contracting jobs there, and indeed there were many, there are many. Um, this is Norberto, who is a water hauler. He came from California because he thought he could make more money hauling water which he does. Um, this is uh, Daryl. Uh, Daryl who came without a job but thought he might be able to find one pretty quickly. We met him in um, um, uh, Applebee's one evening. We were eating dinner and, and there was Daryl, very excited and happy to be there but no job. Um, a few days later he found a job as a driller and he's still there. This is Harley uh, Bingenheimer, who has worked for about 16 years uh, on an oil rig, uh, which means he works two weeks and then he has two weeks off to be with his family. Uh, this is one of the many, many new roads there um, in this picture of uh, preparation for fracking. Uh, you see the oil pad there and all the tanks. So that means that the um, oil rig has already been there and gone again. They have drilled the, the, uh, the hole all the way down three or 4,000 feet deep and all the way across horizontally. And now uh, the next team comes in to, uh, to do the fracking. This is an aerial view of fracking. You can see, um, I don't know, I, I don't know. Is this, this is a pointer? Okay, but I don't know how to work it. So. The, right in the middle, you see the trucks gathered in a sort of circle, and right in the middle is the hole, this very sort of innocuous looking hole. That is, 
what is being fracked. Um, these are oil wells on a, a very fragile landscape of prairie potholes, prairie potholes made by the receding glacier, and a very um, strong area for um, migrating, uh, migrating birds. Um, a couple of oil pads right on the Missouri River. Um, sometimes the, the oil pads are drilled dangerously close um, to the river. Sometimes even in the river if there's flooding. I mean, if there's flooding, it, it floods the area. Um, this, this is an oil pad that, this has the, uh, the oil rig, and so they're just drilling the initial hole first. And then you see this sand pit in front of it. Uh, the sand, though, is probably not for fracking that. It most certainly is not, because fracking sand is a very particular kind of sand that usually has to be imported. A lot of it comes from Wisconsin. So here is another uh, energy use of trucking in um, the sand for fracking. This is J.R. Henderson, a, a person who became a friend of ours who is the supervisor on uh, the oil rig that we visited most often, which was a whiting uh, rig. He, um, he's a cowboy, and he's working uh, as this supervisor, which sometimes requires being up two or three days in a row because uh, of problems that may come up when they're drilling, sand collapsing uh, or something. And, uh, but he's saving money to have his own herd of cattle in um, uh, Montana, where he's from. Um, he chided us often about, um, he said, well, I don't see how you can criticize the oil boom. You came here on oil, didn't you? Which, of course, we did. We did. And this is um, Fred and Joyce Evans, um, no relation to me. Fred was very shrewd. He bought up the um, many, many leases before anyone realized that, um, that this oil underground was going to be accessible. And so um, he now is a, is a wealthy man. He and his family are quite wealthy. And he, um, they also have a, a small bed and breakfast for hunters. And so we stayed there. They were very hospitable to us. And the first morning we woke up and we said, because uh, this oil rig is very near the house. And we said, it smells sort of like oil. And, and he chuckled and said, smells like money, doesn't it? And uh, this is Nelson Bird Bear, um, who lives on the reservation and is hoping for an oil pad in his front yard. And I said, but Nelson, won't it be noisy? And he said, I'm a retired strip miner. I don't mind noise. So, so the oil boom is bringing wealth to people who have never had it and who are very grateful that it's there. Uh, Frank Keogh, a retired banker who sold um, his land but kept the mineral rights. Edith Pladson, who is a retired school teacher and, and uh, raised her family extremely poor. They didn't even have indoor plumbing. And her daughter is about my age and uh, told me something about her life growing up. And we visited the farm where she uh, grew up. That farm now has two oil wells on it. And so now Edith Pladson is, um, is a wealthy woman. Um, and finally, I'll close with uh, the story of Brenda Jorgensen, who is, um, who, this is her land, and you see the oil pad right at the end of their driveway and the house there. Um, this is their valley, which shortly after I took this picture had a pipeline going across it. And this is their land, too, with this house surrounded by, um, uh, by a, an, an oil rig. Um, so I think that um, I'm closing with this picture because just this week uh, we learned that there was an oil spill in North Dakota and it was um, 20 million 600, 20,600 gallons of oil. Barrels, excuse me. Yes, thank you. There are 40 gallons in a barrel, 42 gallons in a barrel, barrels of oil. 
And um, this could, might even have been this pipeline because this is, it's very much in the location where that spill happened. It's very close to, uh, to Brenda's home and Brenda and her family's life have, has been changed irrevocably. Brenda now has dreams every night about people invading her home and using her things and leaving a mess. But it's not just a dream, it's a reality for her. And so, um, so I leave you with this word, solstalgia. Solstalgia is a word coined by um, an Australian philosopher, Glenn Albrecht, and it comes from um, Latin, uh, but I'm going to just close right now and say um, what he means with it is a, homestick, a homesickness that happens when one is still at home. A homesickness that happens when one's own landscape has been irrevocably damaged. Um, thank you very much. that I'm sorry for you because that was so beautiful and poetic and I'm I'm going to present some of the basics of hydrofracturing which are just engineering and and I just want to thank Terry for that very um, beautiful presentation and full of heart so now you have I don't know full of legs or something <laughs> so not mine I mean the just the, the the stools that set up the hydrofracturing situation so um, I also feel a sisterhood with Terry because it's my father's name. Happy birthday to Sam. Um, and I was born in Rolling Prairie and we have white deer at Argonne. So. And then I have a brotherhood with Rob who is like our Lord Stanley of hydrofracturing. So it's just a great honor to be here with both of them. We have the better guy on our stage than they did next door, right? So. Um, so I'll just give a little bit about, first, the projections. So in other words, it's here and it's going to keep going, so we need to try to figure out how to do this responsibly. Um, give a little bit of the basics that I talked about and then identify some of the environmental health considerations. Rob will be much more articulate about that and then finally look at the opportunities for where we can improve. So to explain, we've seen this boom as also maybe um, ironically verbed. Um, in the development of um, shale oil and gas. So we can see that there are a number of plays, that is, um, basins that are identified as attractive for development and, have, and that development has started in a big way and it's going to keep going by these projections. You can see that um, the shale gas is the, the one um, energy form, energy development form that is um, increasing and in several projections over the last several years that's been the case. So the aim is to try to get toward lower carbon um, emissions, the lower carbon energy so we can control the emissions so we don't have things like the old coal-fired power plants releasing so much CO2 to the air. And so you can see that in fact the natural gas development has a really big boost and it's when it has a, a great power generating capacity. So Yikes. <gasps> Sorry. So the promise is there, and, and now it's a matter of trying to make that promise responsible. I guess I should stay with my little legs over there, but then I was afraid I'd be like Terry, where just the, like the top of my head was showing <laughs> podium. So um, you can see that the projection, now um, oil and other liquids are way down there at the bottom. They were around 4%. Now it's toward 1%. Coal has, is shifting downward. Uh, a lot of those power plants are aging, same with nuclear, a lot of those power plants are aging, and so it's natural gas and renewables that are on the rise. So this is a common figure, You've, many of you have probably seen it, but just to illustrate that it's an issue for Illinois as well, so I'm looking forward to the last presentation, um, to hear how our excellent um, Department of Natural Resources scientists are getting ready and helping us plan for being responsible. So at the bottom you see this zebra chart, it just from Danny Reibel at Texas Tech. Um, I had shared a presentation with him, so a number of these slides also are his. But you can see that once it's ramped up in the production, it keeps going. So as more and more of these hundreds and thousands of wells are put in place and sometimes refract, um, that production will continue for decades. 
So um, you can see here that the, the basin of interest in this plot and also in the one on the top left is actually a little bit bigger. So there's more of Illinois, depending on the, the data that we are only still developing, that could be affected. So, and also it's important to know that the, the development, as Terry said, is um, thousands of feet down, can be one mile, two miles deep. So the aquifers that we use for drinking water are in the shallower areas, and so it's going through those with casings um, in the drills so that the aim is to not impact those aquifers and reach way down to those shale deposits where that, um, the gas and oil is, is waiting to, well, it was nicely behaving itself down there until um, we started developing it. So now the issue is there are leaks, so there's um, more discussion of that coming from Rob. But the, the way the process works is that the, the well is drilled deep with high pressure and fracking fluid is sent down there. So the, the, the sandstone cracks, those fractures propagate, propent, the sand that Terry talked about is sent down there as well so that it pushes the fluid and, and opens up the channels for the gas then to come out of the shale deposits and come up for the recovery to the extraction of the gas. And just to illustrate the several steps of this water cycle, because water is a major resource that's used, first, all those 400, 700,000 gallons of water that are needed to develop a well are brought to the site in trucks, zillions of trucks coming past people's um, homes to the sites, and then the water is, um, is injected through, you can see the drinking water well, so that aquifer is what the, the wellhead, that injection goes much deeper than that. Um, at this, the chemical mixing occurs at the surface with those fracking fluids, and then when the, the gas comes up, some of the water flows back up as well. And as the well continues to produce gas, then the flowback water is then called production water after the first weeks or so, and then for years that production water is returning to the surface and has to be managed. So many sites have um, wastewater treatment plants there, many other sites do not, and our, th those fluids are sent to the public, publicly owned water treatment, um, wastewater treatment plant, for example, that's often the case in Pittsburgh, I mean in Pennsylvania with the Marcellus Shale. Um, in other areas like Texas, that water is reinjected down into, for example, abandoned um, conventional gas, uh, old abandoned shafts. So you can see that, that there's a lot of um, areas where there can be issues for the environment and starting with the development of that well pad. And the fracking fluids um, are, are proprietary in many cases, so the disclosure of what those chemicals are is an issue because it's hard for us to plan to protect our health and the environment when we don't know the full combination of what those chemicals are and they continue to be um, developed, new chemicals to do a, a further job of, of um, opening up those fractures. So you can see the types of chemicals that are in that and this is an example of the produced water and here's from um, Brian Ellis is University of Michigan, he's an excellent researcher, and here's an example of the kinds of chemicals that are used in Michigan. I better go faster, I think, because I'm waiting for Mark to pop up out of his seat. So, um, so the total dissolved solids in that water that comes back to the surface is very high. And that means there's a lot that needs to be done to figure out the best way to treat that water because it can't just be released um, onto the surface. And so they, they can put it in evaporation ponds, I mentioned they can underground inject it, they can send it to water treatment plants, or they can try to treat and reuse it. And this last part is the hardest because it's just so full of dissolved solids, especially chlorides and, um, and barium, strontium, calcium, a lot of the heavy metals as well, arsenic, lead. So you'll see that in another slide, so I probably shouldn't be saying it now. Um, so here are the, again, the uh, schematic of the types of activities that are all compressed into this single well pad, and there are so many of these within a region and across the country being developed. Um, so one of the issues is environmental um, 
of environmental concern is water quantity. So we know that in this recent months, we've not had a drought, but there's a lot of water that's drawn out to develop a well. So a low estimate is on the order of a million, typical two to five million, but high estimates, depending on well, on the location, we have 13 million gallons just to develop a single well, for a single frack of that well. And often they have to refrack a well. So you can see that although now we're not in a drought condition, um, last year we were, and so if you're pulling that much water out of an already stressed environment, there are consequences, especially in that location. That, so it's especially a local issue. So there are concerns. So we want gas in our homes. We want to be able to light the burner and cook our food and heat our homes, but we don't want to light our faucet and have it be the shale gas boom. So, um, so the concern is making sure that we manage the water that's coming back up to the surface and make sure that it's not getting into the drinking water supplies. And even when it's sent to treatment, that that treatment is actually being able to treat the chemicals that are in that combined um, produced water. And finally, the um, issues are also extend to microbial growth. So some microbes, if you try to use that water and re-inject it down, will foul the well. The odor is an issue for a number of locations. So it's not only chemicals, but uh, radionuclides and naturally occurring and microbes as well. So uh, North Dakota had a flood, or had a spill, Colorado had a flood, so there are always situations where there are unintended releases and sometimes they're devastating. So this one in Alberta, um, there was another one in Texas just wiped out the vegetation in its path. And so it's not only sensitive uh, ecosystems that Terry so aptly described, but also ecosystems that have been thriving for years that in a flash are, um, are starting over. So um, the, another concern is for local wildlife, including for the ranchers, and, and one of the questions is the potential for human exposures through the food chain for some of the exposures, for example, for dairy and beef. And so one of the approaches that, um, that are applied for food safety is to try to hold the animals before slaughter so that testing can be done. Not, of course, while the government is shut down, but, but so those are some of the suggestions that people have made in areas that, that they have identified have contamination in the, on the land and in the water. Um, so I, before we started, this gentleman near the front who was talking about the fracking sands from Wisconsin and Terry brought them up as well. So they're very high, high quality sands and so it's not just Wisconsin, it's Minnesota, Iowa and also Illinois that, that are now those mining um, of those, look of the sand mines are, are boosting up just like the shale gas production. So these are in re other locations distant from the development of the hydraulic fracturing that are also being affected and the transport routes all along that um, distance from, in some cases, southwestern Wisconsin to North Dakota. So um, we've long known that fine particulate matter is a problem for human health and um, so Minnesota is among, among the states who are trying to develop a standard because of this concern for um, the frac sand exposures. and. Um, we are among the many cities who have issues with our air quality already. And in fact, 40% um, of the metropolitan areas across the US are in the same situation. So in where I grew up, Rolling Prairie and South Bend, we also get an F for particle pollution. So it just, and a D for ozone. So that means that the contributions, the additional contributions overlaying on what's already an air quality issue is something that must be accounted for in, in responsibly developing these. So this is my little niece to say that asthma is on the rise and, um, and there are a lot of exposure issues that are, that are already trying to be addressed without having this additional overlay. So just to pop through, since I think we heard some of this very nicely already from Terry, and my stand-up not comedian was already up. Um, so the traffic, the releases, the, the promise of cleaner energy, which actually go out the window if the leaks aren't controlled. So 3% of the methane leaks, it's about as bad as coal. So there are a lot of places in this process where we can make improvements so that we can 
be more responsible as we know it's here, we know it's going to continue and to grow, and so these are among the approaches that we can apply um, to try to look at the combined effects of the chemicals and make sure we develop protective exposure levels. For example, we know toluene and noise combined cause a greater than an additive adverse effect on hearing, and both of those stressors are present in the hydrofracturing. So it's that kind of science that is being brought to bear by a number of studies from federal agencies, state agencies, and community groups are especially important because it keeps this issue front and center and everyone's affected. So this is the good Margaret, as I was saying to Terry um, and Alaka, and I appreciate the opportunity to have been here today. Um, well, first of all, uh, thank you, Terry, for the beautiful photographs. I'd encourage all of you to, to take a look at the exhibit upstairs because it's really a wonderful, and I think a very balanced exhibit about both the positives and some of the negatives associated with this process. And also to, to Margaret for giving us a nice over overview of this. My name's Rob Jackson. I'm a professor at Duke University, and for the last uh, four years or so, I've spent a lot more of my life than I expected to studying this process in different ways. So what I'm going to do today is just t spend a few minutes telling you a bit about some of what we found, some of what we haven't found, because what we haven't found is just as important as what we have in terms of uh, contaminants that we don't see in people's water and air, for instance. Um, I'm going to start, though, by saying, you know how we always say it's a pleasure to, you know, thank you for being here, it's a pleasure to be here, blah, 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 blah. Well, this really is a pleasure for me because I used to come to the Field Museum as a kid and the Museum of Science and Industry, although I live in North Carolina now, and I used to go see the Blackhawks play, so I see a few red shirts out there. Um, so hats off to them. I'm going to talk about work uh, with a colleague, Abner Vengosh, in particular, and I'll try and mention some of the other people involved in this research as I go along. But I want to start with a photograph. Now, I'm not a, a, a photographer like Terry is, but I, but I took this picture from a helicopter in the Marcellus. And what I particularly want you to see or to think about is the proximity between where people live and where some of this industrial activity is. So what you're looking here, obviously, is a farm in the background, and then this industrial activity that in Pennsylvania until recently could be as close as 250 feet away. And the person in that farmhouse might own the mineral rights. They might not. The person in that farmhouse might have sold the mineral rights to the drillers, or they may not, because that, that well pad might be on their neighbor's property or not. So it's this juxtaposition, I think, as much as anything else, that causes so much of the, of the friction that you read about. Because you see people who are very happy, I talk, you know, dairy farmers who are very grateful for the royalties they've received. And, you, and I talk to people who are bitterly unhappy about this process, about what it's done to the landscape, like, like Terry documented. So all of that happens in the same community, in the same churches, on the same streets. Um, just a few sample images. Uh, uh, Brian Walsh's Time uh, magazine cover from, from a couple of years ago, This Rock Could Power the World, as, this, as, as the shale gas and unconventional energy boom was expanding. Uh, this cartoon, pro-driller, anti-driller. And then this house, so I'll, I'll point out again, this is in the Marcellus of Pennsylvania. I took this photo. There's the drilling rig behind that house. And these are two adjacent houses where the father and son no longer speak to each other because the father is against uh, this drilling process and the son is for the drilling process and sold his mineral rights to the company. All right, what are some of the environmental concerns that people think about in this? Well, here's some of the things that we've worked on. The water that's required. Margaret just, just spoke to you about that. I won't, I won't cover that today except to say this is particularly important in dry areas. So for instance, the Eagle Ford Shale in South Texas. Where, where it's a, an arid area, most of that water is coming from groundwater pumping. You have people who are selling groundwater um, um, uh, from that groundwater being pumped, and then you have uh, aquifer levels dropping, but not an easy story necessarily to tie those dropping aquifers to one particular thing, like shale gas. Could, you know, there are more people in some cases. There are droughts. Um, so establishing cause and effect isn't always easy. Drinking water quality, I'll talk about briefly. Uh, disposal of the wastewater that Margaret referred to. Um, air quality interactions, and then one I won't cover today, earthquakes from hydraulic fracturing and disposal, and this is mostly an issue with the deep injection. And any time, whether it's uh, wastewater disposal or carbon dioxide storage or any kind of waste disposal, that we pump millions and millions of gallons of anything underground under high pressure, you have the possibility that faults will slip. 
Um, and that's, that's what you see particularly with wastewater injection on the disposal side of this. Not so much with the actual fracking itself. All right, why are people concerned about what's in the water? Well, um, Margaret showed you some of this. Uh, there are hundreds of chemicals that have been documented being used. Some of them are harmless. Some of them are carcinogens. Some of them are hazardous air pollutants. So there's a whole range of uh, acids that are used to dissolve uh, carbonates underground. Uh, hydrocarbons that are used to, to, uh, to kill microbes as biocides. Compounds that are used to affect the viscosity or the, the flow properties of the, of the material. So all of these are used in a, in a cocktail that differs depending on the geology and the company that's doing the work. All right, let's talk about water for a minute. Um, I'll spend just a couple of slides on our work. This is a map of the Marcellus, uh, in the Marcellus. Here's the border between Pennsylvania and New York. So this is an interesting place to work. So we published the first papers looking at groundwater quality. We asked a simple question. We asked, is a person's water any different if they live near an oil or gas well than people living farther away? So we used the state boundary line between New York and Pennsylvania because New York has a moratorium on high volume hydraulic fracturing. But the geology is essentially the same. So this is like a fence line comparison if you're, if you're dealing with the landscape. Uh, we can compare what's going on right below that state line where the drilling is occurring to what's going on above that state line where the moratorium on high volume hydraulic fracturing is occurring. That's what we've been doing for the last three or four years. That's a picture of Nat Warner, a grad student sampling um, in the upper, uh, upper left. We contact people. We knock on their doors, we walk up their driveways, we sample their, their well water. We focus on people on private water wells, the 45 or so million people like me, um, because we don't have any safeguards or testing for water unless, unless you pay for that yourself. All right, so what have we found? Well, first of all, what haven't we found? After sampling hundreds and hundreds of houses now in the Marcellus, we've never found evidence for uh, naturally occurring radioactivity. That's, that's found deep underground. We haven't seen evidence for the salts that are found deep underground. The, the, the natural water that's thousands of feet underground is much saltier than, than the ocean in this area. Um, in the past year or so, we've been looking at the fracturing chemicals and haven't really found evidence for that, or at least not evidence that we can unequivocally attribute. But what we have found, uh, most of all, is stray gas contamination. So that means if you're living within about a kilometer, this is the kilometers on the x-axis, so that'd be about two-thirds of a mile there. Methane concentration here. If you're in this gray band, you're in the area where the Department of Interior recommends that you take action to lower the methane concentrations in your, in your water because anything above that, that band is super saturated. Up here, they bubble like champagne. All right? And that only happens within about a kilometer. Now, it's equally important to say there is methane in most everyone's water in this area that has nothing to do with oil and gas drilling. It's a consequence of the migration of methane through millions of years of time from deep underground. That's what you're seeing here. Okay, most people have no methane. Most people within a, in a kilometer have low methane in their houses. Um, and you have natural, uh, naturally occurring high levels, but then you have this population of, of, uh, of high methane that's, uh, that's dangerously high in some of these cases in a minority of houses. We see the same thing even more dramatic for ethane and propane. Um, and we also spend a lot of time in my group looking at the source. That's what you're looking at here. You won't be able to see, but this is a combination of the chemical isotope signatures um, of, of ethane and methane here. So Marcellus gas is up here, shallower gas is down here. So we can match up those high concentrations of gases that we see to the source of that methane underground. All right, now, the most important thing that I'm after is solutions. I want to use the information that we take to help solve problems, to make things better. So after our first paper came out in 2011, we made some recommendations about things like setbacks. Um, the setback law in Pennsylvania at that time, the, the presumptive liability law in Pennsylvania at that time was 1,000 feet. All right, based on our, our one, one kilometer distance, we recommended that that distance should be 3,000 feet because that's the distance out to which we saw an interaction with the stray gas concentrations. Uh, last year, Pennsylvania increased that, in a new law, increased that distance to 2,500 feet. They increased the setback distance from 250 feet to 500 feet. Still not very far, and not far enough, in my opinion, as, a, as an environmental scientist. Um, and they moved the uh, uh, distances out to uh, municipal water wells and things like that. So the states are doing things to, to put uh, stronger safeguards into place. 
Now, we worked with the USGS in Arkansas, a totally different area, in, uh, in the Fayetteville Shale. We don't see anything there. We see no evidence of water contamination in that system at all. Uh, I, I believe that the difference in this case is partly due to the geology. The, the aquifer in this case has a much tighter confining layer above and below. So it's sealed better. Um, could be the operators, could be local rules, could be a lot of things. But geology is certainly playing a, a role. The key point is it doesn't have to be that way that you, that you saw on the Marcellus. All right, let me spend just a few more minutes on wastewater and air. Um, you know, what's in that wastewater that people are concerned about? I talked about what's in the fracking fluids. Uh, well, I mentioned the high salinity, 10 times seawater. Uh, halogens like bromine can interact uh, uh, for high tri trihalomethane formation in drinking water and form carcinogenic compounds. Um, so you don't want to use that water as a water source in a municipal plant. Um, high concentrations of metals, arsenic, selenium, barium, and naturally occurring radioactivity. This is a paper we just published a couple weeks ago looking at a water disposal treatment facility. So if you look at the outflow of that facility and then do a transect downstream of that facility uh, different distances both in the water and in the sediments, you can see the, the legacy, if you will, of what's coming out of that wastewater facility, what's legally and appropriately coming out within thresholds of that facility. But just the fact that they're disposing millions and millions of gallons means that in this case we're getting radioactivity building up in the sediments of the river downstream, locally, only close by, but building up to the point where the concentrations are high enough that you would have to dispose of that in a, in a radioactive wastewater facility and dredge that, those sediments. All right, so the consequence of this, the consequence of generating a billion or two billion gallons of wastewater a day in oil and gas operations in the United States is all these other things. That's the price we pay. We have to do something with that water. It's also important to point out the positive things that are going on. And there are a number of, of positive developments driven by industry in the water area. So here are a couple of them. Higher reuse uh, for fracking and recycling. Margaret referred to that. Greater disclosure of the chemicals in fracking fluids. Uh, the voluntary frac focus site. Laws like the state of Illinois just passed. Um, with disclosure, the, the, uh, you know, the, the, the trick in these is the trade secret exemptions that can be claimed. So how rigorously those are, are kept. How many, chemical, how many chemicals are excluded from disclosure, things like that. Ultimately, I believe transparency is critically important because the more transparent this process is, the more pressure there will be on the companies to get rid of the toxic chemicals and the more credit the companies will get for getting rid of those toxic chemicals. Um, some companies have suggested they can frack without any chemicals at all. This is a, a company in the UK. That would, that would resolve many of people's concerns, not all, but many. And finally, green completions and elimination of open wastewater pits is another, another thing. Okay, I'm finishing up uh, uh, air quality. Margaret talked to you a little bit about this. Here's the sand consequence, not so much of mining. Here's sand in the air. That's a picture from the Eagleford Shale where the, where the workers with protective masks on were still being exposed to dangerous levels of, of sand because the dust concentrations were so high. We have cases like this on the front range of Colorado, where this is a work of Boulder and, and, and Colorado University scientists, not mine. Um, here's Denver. These are oil and gas wells. Here's their observatory. And they started seeing these anomalous plumes of, of benzene and other hydrocarbons in the air when the wind direction was from this way. So environmental monitoring gives us information to, to, uh, to see, to document some of these sources and things that could potentially uh, have health implications for people like this kind of study from Western Colorado where they documented people living within half a mile uh, being greater risk to exposure to benzene, ethyl benzene, toluene, and xylene. So this is what's blowing downwind for people who are close to those well pads. And again, think about that proximity of where people live and where this industrial activity is. Finally, and I'm, uh, I'm done, I'll give you one last example from our work. So I uh, and my group have been interested in a long time in the emissions of greenhouse gases to the air. We've been working in cities and from well pads. Here's Boston. Uh, we put a mobile methane analyzer in a car. This is with colleagues at Boston University, Nathan Phillips. Uh, drove every, bro every block of the 800 miles in the city of Boston and produced a map of, 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 uh, of leaks. Red is road miles driven. Yell, yellow are the leaks. There are 3,400 natural gas leaks that we found across the city of Boston. Information is useful to solve problems, right? So the idea here isn't to say go fix 3,400 leaks. It's go fix the 200 biggest leaks that might be explosive that are health risks 
that are giving off 80% of the greenhouse gases. Okay, the source information, just like in the water work, tells us that those leaks uh, in the air match the pipeline gas, not the biological sources like landfill, sewers, and such. And now we're working on the skyscrapers to document the total flux from the, from the city. Okay, then finally, Washington, D.C. is what we've done next. That's the Capitol building, obviously. All right, summary for the take-home work for leaks. We have a, an immediate opportunity to tighten the natural gas supply chain, improving con consumer safety, economics, uh, climate change, and air quality. Um, and we've called for a national campaign to do this uh, across cities in the U.S. and around the world. So I'll leave you with this, turn it over to the next speaker. You know, where will our energy come from? If it's not fracking, is it mountaintop mining? I flew over this when I flew from North Carolina yesterday to Chicago, Illinois, and Kentucky and West Virginia. This is what you see from the window of the plane. All right? Is it tar sands in Alberta that's greenhouse gas and water intensive? Is it, is it renewables like wind and solar? Thank you. Hi, everybody. My name is Alaka Wally. I work here at the Field Museum. I'm an anthropologist. I think I should start with that joke from the TV commercial. I'm not an expert on fracking, but I did stay at a Holiday Inn Express. I'm an anthropologist um, who, though, has studied the social dimensions of large-scale energy development. My very first uh, research project was looking at the uh, impact of a hydroelectric dam in eastern Panama where indigenous people were forcibly resettled in order to make the dam. And what I did was look at the consequences of, the social consequences of this kind of large scale uh, development. And so what I want to talk to you today a little bit about in, is the social dimensions of fracking. And I think you've heard some of this here uh, from the other speakers, and particularly in the vivid stories that Tari is telling us through her photographs about how people have, you know, woven this event of this kind of new development into their lives and the dilemmas that it's bringing up. I want to put this a little bit into cross-cultural or uh, perspective and to tell you, talk a little bit about um, energy and people and that to say that what we've seen here, the cases we've seen that are affecting our country is part of a global pattern. It's not just our country that is affected by these kinds of massive energy projects and what that does to people. So we as anthropologists have long studied how our need for energy, um, you know, it's Rob's last slide, where is our energy coming from? How our need for em energy impacts our social life. And in industrial societies like ours, we have resorted to massive infrastructure projects that disrupt people's life ways. So think about dams, oil fields, and now fracking as these kinds of massive energy projects that are disrupting folks' lives. There is a pattern to that disruption. It's not just a random pattern. And uh, so there are some common elements to the social impact of energy infrastructure projects. First of all, there's this frontier effect that you see in North Dakota that Terry showed, um, which is where boom towns uh, start building up, populated especially by men, accompanied by bars and brothels, and other sorts of um, economic, this, uh, I love that story of the woman who came from Moldova to work in the hotel. You know, this kind of frontier town builds up with uh, services for all the men who have come in search of jobs. It's mostly men who come to do the work on these big energy projects. And that boom and bust so, you know, inevitably what happens if you look at massive energy projects is they're there for a while and then there's, they're gone. The massive construction phase lasts and people, thousands come in to work and then they go and you're left with a depressed economy. So it's this kind of boom and bust cycle that uh, ruptures social life. And there is this also this deep sense of loss felt by local people as they watch the changes in their home 
landscape, what um, Terry referred to as solastalgia, you know, and it is, I've seen that with the people I did research with in Panama, and I'm seeing it in the Amazon with indigenous people there as well as they experience, um, you know, they, they don't have a chance to leave or, the, you know, they love where they live and then to watch their landscape be destroyed by these massive energy is, is I would say, it's a traumatic experience. Um, in the case of the Kuna, if I can just tell the story from Panama very quickly, for them, trees were sacred. And so this is a forested landscape, tropical forest where they lived, that they had basically managed for, since um, the Spanish had displaced them from their original homeland. And then as the dam was being built, they cut down a massive amount of trees to create you know, the basin where the dam floodwaters would go. And for the Kuna to watch their trees, you know, now suddenly be cut down and then to see that that didn't have massive consequences for the people who cut down those trees, it was very, you know, um, shocking, I guess is a good way of putting it, because it sort of brought into question their whole belief system and how they had to deal with that. So, um, so that solastalgia, that loss of, that sense of loss about your place um, is a really, I, I can't um, overstate how um, that affects people in these places. I think um, we have to think though a little bit, um, I thought those two presentations from were so wonderful because they made the technology very accessible and they bring up the technological dilemmas. But I think we also have to think beyond technology. Um, we have to think, um, we have to think that, um, you know, we focus on those technological issues, how deep is the well, how much water is being used, but we do not, we do not often see the social infrastructure that governs decision making about energy production and use. The energy industry is made up of powerful and wealthy corporations. Um, they're not people, but yes, they are run by people who want to produce, protect their status and access to resources. This is not new. It's as old as the development of the state, you know, the governing form that we live under. Um, uh, and so I think it would be great if all of you had time today or come back and visit our Ancient Americas exhibit. There's a wonderful video there that talks about the state as a form of governance. It's like, you know, the state meaning a form of administration that marshals resources, um, both administrative, pol religious, and military resources in order to um, make decisions collectively, and that apparatus of the state combined with the private capital that runs the energy industry, that's where the power lo is located that is making most of the decisions about, you know, things like where will the roads go, where will the oil pads be, all of those things. There's a social infrastructure that I think it's important for us to remember, you know, how are the decisions being made about all of this kind of massive energy development and who is making those decisions. Okay, it's, it's important to sort of humanify, I guess is the word, you know, all of this sort of process that's going on beyond the technology. The social power structure is as important to understand as the power that comes from energy production. Behind the infrastructure of roads and gas stations and air-conditioned buildings, electric grids, there is a hierarchical structure that we should make visible so that we can make decision-making more democratic. Now we, um, as a people, need to, you know, think more actively about these decisions that are being made and how much of that decision do we buy into? How can we begin to have an impact on these decisions. Um, you know, so going back to that quote from, uh, that Terry brought up of, well, you used oil to get here. You know, those roads that were built across this country 
were, uh, you know, pushed by an auto industry that wanted people to drive cars in order to generate capital for the oil and for the auto industry. But I don't want to leave you with a kind of, you know, this kind of overwhelmingly gloom and doom perspective because that's not really, as people who know my work know, I'm not about the gloom and doom. Because as, all, as important it is, as it is to understand that the power structure, the social power structure is unequal, it's important to also understand that from time and time again throughout human history and even today, the people like us who seemingly do not, are not part of that big power structure also have power to make change happen. And so I'm so glad that Margaret ended with my Margaret Mead, my favorite anthropologist, not really, but hey, she, she's the well-known anthropologist. Um, her quote there about a small group of people can make a difference, and what we anthropologists, we call it the power of the weak. Um, weak, meaning us as weaker than the power concentrated in the hands of industry and big um, state-like apparatuses. Um, so people draw on what we can do to make change, what we do to change society in the face of that inequality is we draw on the considerable creativity that we have, that, that power imbalance cannot contain. The power imbalance does not affect the ability that we have to think creatively. And in fact, in many cases, as I've seen in the Amazon, for example, indigenous people who are the most marginalized in their societies have tremendous creative power and they've started to think about different ways and different alternatives as they you know, faced uh, this kind of massive disruption and how to resist it. So we have to use that considerable creativity that we have to seek to rebalance the social structure. And, um, you know, and time and time again, people have done that. They've, done, they've used their creativity uh, to rebalance social structure. And then when they do that, empires fall. So keep hope alive. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Mike Ziri. Um, I am formerly with the Department of Natural Resources, but as of uh, this week, I am now with the Illinois Environmental Protection Agency. In both agencies, uh, department and agency, I have served legislative roles. So that will inform my discussion today. Uh, and although my time is limited, I'm going to give a brief overview of Illinois policy on hydraulic fracturing, including the new law that was just passed in late May by the General Assembly and approved by Governor Quinn on June 17th of this year. And that is the Hydraulic Fracturing Regulatory Act, or Public Act 98-22. And the reason this law is so important is prior to this law, there were no regulations in the state of Illinois on hydraulic fracturing at all. Um, important to keep in mind, hydraulic fracturing has been occurring in the state since probably the late 40s, early 50s. But nothing on the scale of what you see in North Dakota, or Pennsylvania, or Ohio, or the other uh, large-scale states such as those. Um, and Recently, a lot of land has been leased in southeastern Illinois in what is the uh, New Albany Shale area. And that pushed uh, a lot of policymakers to take a look at this and say, hey, we have no regulations, we have no rules, there's nothing governing this process. And let's try to avoid some of the problems that other states have encountered. Let's try to avoid some of the situations um, by being proactive. Uh, also, we, we discovered in looking through our records at the Department of Natural Resources um, on some of the reports that drill, uh, oil and gas operators and producers file with us, they voluntarily disclosed certain information, which wasn't required, but they did, including the, how much water they may have used, how much chemicals. And in doing so, we discovered that there was a six, at least a 600,000 gallon frack job that was done in late 2011 or early 2012. So this really pushed the policymakers, it pushed the governor, it pushed members of the legislature to, to sit down and negotiate a piece of legislation and that piece of legislation that ended up becoming the Hydraulic Fracturing Regulatory Act. And it involved negotiations over two years with representatives, representatives of environmental organizations, so the Sierra Club, the NRDC, the Illinois Environmental Co Council, Faith in Place, representatives of industry, 
the Illinois Farm Bureau, uh, representatives of the uh, labor organizations, Illinois AFL-CIO, the Illinois Attorney General's Office, the Governor's Office, Illinois EPA, Illinois DNR. Uh, and it resulted in what is a 123, 125-page bill, uh, the Hydraulic Fracturing Regulatory Act, that was passed by the General Assembly, signed by the Governor, went into effect immediately. So it covered, immediately, hydro, high volume horizontal hydraulic fracturing was regulated. Where there were no regulations before, now there was this set of regulations in place. Um, in a moment, I'll just briefly go through what are some of the provisions, but I just want to say, um, a lot of the components of the bill are not fully in effect yet because the department is developing the rules. And while the Department of Natural Resources developed the rules, high volume horizontal hydraulic fracturing cannot occur. Uh, otherwise, it would be in violation of the law and subject to the penalties in the bill. So what's in this new law? Um, you know, we looked at what other states have done. Uh, we, we looked at best practices. We tried to look at best practices in negotiating this bill. And uh, whereas previously, if an entity wanted to hydraulically fracture, all they would have to do is submit an application to drill the well. Right now, it's $100. It's going to go to $300 thanks to a, a fees package the department successfully pushed last year through the legislature. But all they'd have to do is submit that application and $300. Now, with this new law, they have to get a high-volume horizontal hydraulic fracturing permit in addition to their drilling permit. And that comes with a $13,500 permit fee, $11,000 goes to DNR, $2,500 to Illinois EPA. Uh, and that application includes uh, a list of plans, uh, including a well site safety plan, a water management plan, a traffic management plan, a fluid storage and disposal plan, a containment plan, a casing plan, uh, notices of, uh, drafts of public notices, the names and addresses of all property owners within 1,500 feet of the well site, uh, a certification that the well site will be restored and reclaimed to uh, a condition approximating what it was before the fracking and the, uh, the drilling occurred, uh, a consent from municipal authorities to allow the uh, hydraulic fracturing to go on if the well is going to be within the boundaries of a municipality, uh, a bond, um, and there's other things required, but those are really the highlights of the application uh, the department will look at the application, determine the effectiveness of the plans, make a permit decision. But key to that and part of that is there are some public participation elements in that permit application process. There's public notice specific to those landowners within 1,500 feet and also a general notice put in local newspapers, a 30-day public comment period where anyone can write a comment to the department. There's also the opportunity for a public hearing for, uh, to be... Um, for certain individuals who live in the other radius of the well site. And then after a public hearing, if one's held, there's a discretionary 15-day follow-up public comment period to comment on anything that may have come out in the hearing. So there's those, those public participation elements, and those are important because traditionally public hearings, such as the one in the, in the, legisl in the, in the law, come after a permit decision. So for instance, as I understand it, in the coal program that the department has to administer, the department makes a decision on that permit application, approves or denies, then there's the, the hearing, the contested case hearing. That actually comes before the permit decision in this case, which is unique. Um, so those are, public participation is a large component, and it was something the governor made sure that he wanted to be in there, a robust public participation. Um, also, uh, previous uh, speakers mentioned chemical disclosure, which is part of the bill. At least 21 days before the, uh, the permittee uh, commences with the fracking operation, they have to provide a list of chemicals to be used to the department. That list is then posted on our website. Um, if they change that list after, they give us it, after the list is given to us, they have to notify the department within 24 hours if there's an addition or subtraction to the chemical list. Now, there are trade secret protections in the bill, but unlike most other states, that, uh, that request is, has to be rooted through the department. So the, 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 let's say the, the chemical formula is still given to the department with a statement of justification as to why it should be trade secreted. The department will make a determination, but what, you know, whatever the department determines based on that justification, the department still holds the trade secret. So we still have access to it, we still can you know, control it. And if a, if a medical professional articulates a need, or if, um, if there's an emergency, that information can be released. Uh, and that, the process for release is being articulated by the department in the rulemaking process. And that's different than most states. Most states do utilize the FRAC-focused website. 
The department decided that we wanted to do it. We're the regulators. So that the disclosure should be posted on, on the department's website, not a third party website. And most other states um, do not have the department where the, uh, the regulator controls the, the secret, even if it's determined to be a secret. So that's unique among the states. Also, uh, there's a water quality monitoring investigation um, components to the bill. Uh, an applicant for the permittee, the, when they uh, put in their permit application, must provide the Department of Natural Resources with a work plan for water testing. And they have to test all water sources within 1,500 feet of the well site. And they have to test it before they frack. So you have a baseline test, essentially a liability test. And then they have to test six, 18, and 30 months after they finish fracking. Um, so essentially, it creates a, a baseline for liability purposes. The bill contains a rebuttable presumption. So if, uh, if the pollution is determined and found, the permittee is determined, is deemed automatically to have caused the pollution unless they can rebut it with evidence otherwise, which for Illinois pollution law is very unique in itself. Um, the test results have to be submitted to the department within seven days. Uh, a landowner can enter into a non-disclosure agreement to uh, not release, to not have the, for the, the permittee not to release those test results to the department, but if any results show an exceedance above the standards set for pollution by the law, then that information must be released to the department. So the department and the Illinois EPA will always be aware of uh, pollution in that case. Um, if someone wants to complain or they think their water is polluted, the department will always accept complaints. The agency will always accept complaints, follow up on investigations on those. Um, and I'm really simplifying the process there, but for the purpose of time, uh, it's, it's much more in depth than that, but the department will follow up on pollution complaints. The agency will follow up on that. The department has authority to order that if, the, if, if pollution is determined, the agency and the department have the authority to tell the permittee, you have to replace that water source with a source of water equal to or better than the water that was polluted. So that's uh, authority the department has. Um, also, just want to touch briefly, uh, well preparation, containment, and operations. Uh, the Illinois Oil and Gas Act, which I'm not sure when it was passed and put into law, but it's the law that governs drilling of oil wells. Uh, for the casing and cementing, it relies on 1980s standards. The department and the other entities involved here said that won't work. So we incorporate the latest standards for well construction and casing in this bill. Um, fracking fluids, uh, you may have seen some, in some of the photos, you may have seen the open pits uh, with chemicals in them or flow back in them. In Illinois, you won't see that because the law requires any fluids except fresh water to be stored in above ground airtight, uh, I believe steel anti-corrosive containers. And the fluids have to be removed within, I believe it's 30 days. Now around those tanks, there can be excess pits, just in case there's excess fluid that overflows, but that must be removed within seven days. So really, um, closed tanks for all fluids except fresh water, fresh water can be, put in, can be stored in pits. Uh, flowback must be removed within 60 days, tested for pollutants, and disposed of only via class two injection wells, so only injection, no treatment. Um, we, we do encourage recycling and reuse, but the only option right now in the law for disposal is a class two injection well. Um, the, within 60 days of completing the fracturing activity, the permittee must provide more information to us in the form of a completion report, including the actual chemicals that were used, whereas previously it was the proposed chemicals. This is the actual final list that gets put on our website. Um, and speaking about website, one of the, the, the unique things also about our law is what we consider the transparency in it. Practically every piece of information that we receive, that the state receives, that the Department of Natural Resources receives, will go on a new hydraulic fracturing website mandated by the law. All that will be on there for public consumption. It will be searchable by county, possibly searchable by other criteria once the department develops the website. But um, this is far and beyond what most of our other regulatory programs do uh, at the department in terms of making information available to the public, making information available to academics, anyone who wants to look at that information see what's going on in their county. The permit application goes online. The records of a public hearing go online. Public comments go online. Chemical disclosure, everything practically goes online with the exception of, prob with the, exception of the trade secrets and any uh, test results protected by the non-disclosure agreement. Um, the bill, I'd be remiss if I also didn't say 
the law contains a severance tax, which is the first severance tax in Illinois on any mineral extraction process. Uh, there's no severance tax on coal, but with this bill, there is a severance tax on oil and gas that is derived and produced through hydraulic fracturing. Um, there's also, uh, there's some discussion about setbacks. Uh, the, depart the law includes inf uh, provisions for setbacks 500 feet from homes, 300 feet from rivers, lakes, streams, uh, ponds, 500 feet from churches, nursing homes, uh, 750 feet from nature preserves, uh, some more sites as nature preserves, 1,500 feet from public water supplies. Um, so those are, uh, and also with the setbacks, they can't use diesel if they want to fracture, and they also are prohibited from discharging into fresh water. And uh, the bill does contain uh, civil and criminal penalties, and also unique to the bill is a citizen's right to action. So if anyone in this audience who, who may be affected adversely and, and lives in the area, if, if you perceive that the Department of Natural Resources isn't doing its job regulating the industry, or if you think the permittee isn't doing their job, you have the right to file a suit to compel action, which is not in the current Illinois Environmental Protection Act. It's unique to this law, um, and uh, I think it's a powerful tool for citizens if they think uh, there's a, an enforcement issue. Uh, I just also want to add the EPA and DNR are the regulators, largely the regulators. DNR is the, the, the main regulator. EPA has the water, con uh, water pollution rule. And we have to use the law as our guidance. So what the legislature passed, we have to follow it. The department is developing rules right now. And uh, I just want to clarify something that may be confusing thanks to some recent media reports, but the department will not be issuing any hydraulic fracturing permits nor accepting hydraulic fracturing permit applications until the administrative rules are in place, and the administrative rules will be put in place through a public process that is established by the Illinois Administrative Procedures Act with the possibility for public comment, and there's also opportunity for public hearing in there as well. And that's a thoroughly public process that involves a committee of legislators called the Joint Committee on Administrative Rules, and they will have the final say on any rules the department develops. And that's a months-long months -long process um, and we're working diligently to produce the rules on those. So that's a really brief overview of the, the new law. There are things in there that I haven't mentioned, but for the sake of time, uh, I condensed it. I do have a couple fact sheets. Um, I've only made about 50 of them. So if you want a fact sheet, see me afterwards. I can give a copy of it to you. It also has my email address on there if you want to email me for more information. Thank you. As we rearrange the furniture on the stage, I'd like to ask people who have questions or would like to enter into the discussion to make your way to one of these two microphones. Okay. Um, we will move back and forth um, from microphone to microphone, allowing the panel to address the questions. I want to remind everyone, though, that we have a very limited time today. Some of our panelists have to catch planes and other things. We'll take as much time as we can with the questions. But please do try to be concise in your question um, so that there's plenty of time for the panelists to answer and address it. Can I ask you guys to come up on, onto the stage, please? Is there light in your eyes? Yeah. There we go. Okay. Um, we'll take our first question from stage right here. This question is for Rob Jackson. You made the statement that there's no naturally occurring radioactivity in the Marcellus Shale, and I wonder if you're aware of the fact that in South Huntington, Pennsylvania, a truck full of cuttings from fracking was rejected at the South Huntington uh, Municipal Dump because it contained 83 rems of radioactivity and the limit for the um, 
M municipal dump was 10. This is more than eight times the allowed amount of radioactivity, and this was carried in a truck by a trucker who was exposed to the radioactivity, and it was carried through neighborhoods where the radioactivity would be exposing people who were uh, uh, outside or even in their homes. And I would like you to answer this question because you made the comment, no naturally occurring radioactivity from the Marcellus Shale. Did I make, Did I make that comment? Okay, all right. Oh, now I understand the question. Okay, so let me make a distinction. Um, so I talked about radioactivity in a couple of contexts, right? I, I talked about the naturally occurring radioactivity that's found deep underground in the water. I talked, what I said was we did not find radioactivity in the drinking water, in the, in the well water in people's houses. We did find radioactivity in the wastewater building up in the, in the sediments of the treatment facility. That was the graph I showed you in the middle of the presentation. So there is no question, and it's well known, that there is naturally occurring radioactivity that comes up in the millions of gallons of produced water from deep underground that must be disposed of. This is cutting from the... Right, so, but, so, but they're solid, so they're scales that build up in the pipes. Um, there are whole sources, but that's, that's a wastewater issue. And I was just trying to make the distinction between drinking water and the wastewater. Everyone knows that the radioactivity occurs in the wastewater, people are concerned about it occurring in their drinking water. We've seen the former, not the latter. Can we get our next question from right here? Sure. I got two questions, if I may, uh, for Professor Jackson and for Mike Zeri. Um I was under the impression that the, from other events I've been to, that you could not take the water once it was used and that cannot be put back into public use. That that had to always be contained, and that were my, my thought was it's going to create a, a yucca mountain effect that we're going to have all this water that can never be used and had to be contained. So you're saying that water is being reused or being treated, and then Mike, I'm questioning what is the liability for the companies if they do uh, break the law? I, I went to a, one at Chamber of Commerce that they said that, uh, that the biggest thing about the the law is now that the companies are liable and they have legal liability for any damages. So a clarification on those two, whether water can be used after it's been, you know, produced, if it can be recycled, and then what about the liability? Thank you. Uh, so just very quickly, we'll move on to, to other people on the panel. But uh, so some of, the, some of the water is deep injected, as, as was talked about by several people far underground. Um, some of the water is reused, in the, and the definition of reuse, at least in the Marcellus area, is treated and then released into surface waters. So the Josephine facility, for instance, that I described to you in my presentation is one of those facilities that uh, actually nowadays doesn't accept much uh, Marcellus um, shale gas wastewater, but has in the past, they've taken that water uh, treat it and then they release it. Now the newer plants, like uh, Eureka is one company that does distillation purification, they have water that actually could be uh, used in a potable source and they have water that they send back to the drilling companies to use to fracture the, the next well, which reduces the amount of water that's used. But the water, but the water is reused in some cases and it is in some cases released back into the environment um, with, in, in some cases, very high salt concentrations and other things in it. Okay. Um, so the bill does lay out the law. Sorry, I'm still in legislative mode. The law does lay out certain civil and criminal penalties, which, depending on the type of violation, could be anything from misdemeanor, if they, uh, if they provide misleading information in an application, or uh, up to a class four felony, and also fines up to uh, $50,000 a day, $100,000 a day, depending on the type of violation. So there are all civ uh, civil and criminal penalties in the bill. Um, it's, it's very extensive, so it's, and actions can be brought by the state's attorney or the Illinois Attorney General on her own behalf, so she doesn't have to necessarily have to wait for the department to bring the action. So it depends on what the type of violation is, but anything from a, a misdemeanor up to a class four felony also fines uh, $50,000 a day up to around $100,000 a day.
Hi, uh, this is a more uh, general question for all, any or all the pa panel who wish to uh, answer it. Uh, all this fracking is uh, supposedly uh, giving us more energy in the form of uh, natural gas and gasoline, but I see there's tons of energy being used up in the process of the fracking. Uh, uh, all the water being pumped under high pressure underground and all the tons of transportation to run all these huge trucks of uh, sand and water and other things around uh, in transportation. To say nothing of the exter externality costs of uh, uh, social ones to people uh, and uh, communities. Uh, uh, but uh, do any of you have any uh, possible figures as to do, <coughs> uh, is the amount of energy that they are getting out of the uh, out of the whole process uh, worth the uh, all of the uh, energy we're uh, putting into it to uh, even uh, try to get it out. Thanks. So yes, those studies have been done. The Energy Information Administration is one source where you can find it at the moment. Um, it's not been updated as of yesterday until the government is back up and running. But there's good information online that you can find for more of the life cycle analysis kinds of looks. But our difficulty in more of the environmental part is we don't have the data. So for some of the aspects, we may not have complete information. And that's why people like Rob and um, and everyone else on the stage and many in the audience and over there are important to being able to fill in the information. But, but for example, there was a slide, maybe in my backup slides, that showed the um, water intensity, so how much water was needed for different types of energy, so whether it was biomass or solar, or wind. So solar is another one that needs a lot of water. So it's not um, necessarily on the surface of seeing just one part of the overall life cycle of an energy development and use um, may give you a skewed picture of what the, the overall energy balance is. So it's an excellent question and there are resources out there that can give you the comparisons. Let's take another question. Okay. Well, um, I just have a question for Mike. Now, you said that the um, 300 feet from homes, or 500 feet, um, 300 feet from rivers? Okay, Colorado just had a flooding. So you're going to have floods, as they had in North Dakota. So I think it's short, and also uh, the gentleman in the middle was speaking of being much farther from homes with it, uh, to be safe for the residents, um, like 3,500 feet, so we're at 1,500 feet, we're short. So there's, legislatively, do, can that be changed? And um, why wasn't that made stronger to begin with when the science was out there? What science are we looking at? Those are my questions. Sure, um, as, a piece, as a law, it can be changed legislatively. Uh, any piece of it can be changed uh, if the General Assembly governor want to do that. So it could be changed. Um, it, it can't be changed through administrative rule because it's, it's statute and the Department of Natural Resources has to look to the law as our guidance. But the legislature could change that if they wanted to. Um, just like you could change any other piece of the law uh, as time goes on. Uh, in terms of why those were decided, um, it was a little piece of legislation was negotiated and that was uh, negotiated by the parties. What, what well, the, the, the negotiations. Um, you know, nego if you, I'm sorry. The, what was the, the science you based your decision on for that? Um, I don't have that information in front of me, um, but that was negotiated, like I said, between the the environmental organizations and industry. It wasn't just industry writing the bill. Uh, it was also the environmental organizations, the CR Club, the NRDC, the Environmental Council, Faith in Place. Also, I forgot to mention the Illinois or the Environmental Law and Policy Center. Well, I just have one comment. I think science, and we asked you when we visited you in Springfield to look at the science of uh, Colorado and, and Grafia and Professor Hamburger. Did you look at any of that? 
Uh, our staff has looked at that, uh, and they're still developing the rules, and I, I couldn't tell you what's in the rules right now, but they're still going through the rulemaking process. And I did share the information that you provided with our staff, as well as information we got from other groups as well. Okay. Next question. A lot of this rush to do all this development is partially premised on the idea that it's going to be better for the environment because it's going to produce something that releases less in terms of the greenhouse gases. And what I'm wondering is, you were talking about the release of the greenhouse gases, um, and I'm wondering in terms of the percentage of greenhouse gases that are being emitted in general, how much gas is escaping? Is there a way to harvest the gas? Because a lot of times we talk about natural gas, but I only hear about us getting oil. So I'm wondering, are we getting gas out of this process? And then I'm also concerned about um, some of the comments that were made earlier in terms of this. I'm thinking in comparing this to the gold rush, which happened out west, where they went in, some people made fortunes, but essentially they abandoned the mines. And having lived out in Colorado, I've seen abandoned mines and the devastation that's created from it. Those towns were abandoned, as Ms. Wally was talking, Dr. Wally was talking about. Um, and I'm just wondering, is there even an economic benefit from this in the long term because of all the resources that are going into the extraction process, if you take into account the environmental devastation, the human um, effects, is this really the best use of our resources? I know that there are a lot of people investing in it. There's a lot of people making money off of this, corporations, individuals who are investors, but as a community, as a collective society, can we really pay the price to develop this at this point where there's so many risks? That's my question. The really big question that we haven't addressed specifically is climate change and how uh, fracking is releasing because of Continue, our continual um, extraction of oil, we keep releasing more and more carbon into the atmosphere and, and quickly passing any uh, possibility of turning around climate change. Uh, and so, you know, everything you ask about, I think, will um, come to pass and worse. <laughs> so, how's that? <laughs> and, and again, I want to reiterate that, the, that your question brings up is, this is about social choices. It's about the way we, you know, together construct our society. And so, you know, if, if we don't want to incur the risks and uh, of, you know, and the social and economic and environmental costs of this kind of development, then we have to think about how much energy do we really need to consume and how can we lower the amount of energy that we do consume? Does every household need so many appliances? Do we need, you know, those are the kinds of questions that we as a society need to ask ourselves. And then the answer to that, those questions are not simple because, you know, we're used to a way of life and it's not about, you know, we can't expect that folks will want to you know, go uh, live, you know, um, uh, a really drastic, you know, change in their energy use regimen. But I think you are beginning to see signs where more and more people are saying, yes, we can live without, um, you know, as much energy as we are accustomed to using. And so the question is, how do we build on that sentiment and that um, you know, uh, sort of growing realization and action that people are taking in industrial countries. Because again, most of the energy use um, is in industrialized countries. You don't see this level of energy consumption in so-called 
you know, less developed countries. So how do we, you know, make sure that the folks in those countries aren't now, which is happening, they're being pushed to consume more energy. Uh, more cars are being sold in China and so on. So how do we globally start thinking on a much uh, more rational scale about these choices we have? Yeah, and you had mentioned at the start of your question fugitive uh, gas emissions. And uh, one thing I didn't get to point out because of time in my presentation, but the bill does have a provision that the permittee is to capture that methane gas that would be otherwise be fugitive. The key is the statute says if it's economically reasonable for the permittee. Um, so that's, that's the key. It's a department decision, correct? Uh, well, the, the language of the statute? Uh, it, that, it could be flushed out in the rulemaking process. I, I assume it could be. So that would be up to the state and then the JCAR process and any comments we receive. Okay. Could, Let's move on wait, to that. Oh. Could, I, could I just say sure. to Dr. Jackson about the ramifications of the gas leakage on, on the carbon, you know, on the um, greenhouse, global warming and all that? So there's a great deal of research going on right now. Our group and many groups uh, in the U.S., <clears throat> and around the world looking at fugitive emissions all the way along the step from production, the extraction of the gas to distribution and use. Um, the estimates range from about 1% of total production lost, you know, 1 to 2% is the EPA current estimate, about 2, all the way up to as high as 7 or 8%. Um, and uh, we don't know what it is nationally. It's clear that it's going to be high in some basins. It looks very high in places in Utah, to some extent Colorado, lower in Texas probably. Um, I, I do think it's important to, th uh, to think about the emissions from other processes, too. So I mentioned tar sands in my talk. We're heading to Canada having 8% of, of the country's greenhouse gas emissions associated with tar sands mining, to give you, know, to give you an example. So other things that we do have, have greenhouse gas consequences, and there are other, as an environmental scientist, there are other metrics that are important, too, uh, particulate and sulfur and pollution from coal-fired power plants kill 10 to 20,000 people a year in this country. Natural gas doesn't have that. So if you can dial down those natural gas leaks and, and burn cleaner natural gas, as I would hope as an environmental scientist in the transition to more renewable fuels, then um, it could still be beneficial. Okay, we're going to move on to the next question. I want to point out that we only have about five minutes left before we'll have to end the formal part of the presentation. So I want to apologize in advance to anyone whose question we don't get to and invite you to stick around to speak to those panelists who are able to stay a little bit longer once we close down. Next question, please. Okay, in response to that, quest, that uh, part that you said, it has to be according to economic feasibility. It also has to be according to the safety for the environment. And I have the law right here. Okay, according to that law, it is the obligation of the state of Illinois to provide for the safe management of low radioactive waste. And uh, all shell is radioactive. We can maintain that because that's, it's found by the geologists because it's radioactive. The flow back water is the only thing that's measured according to the bill. And that's not radioactive. It's the produced water that is radioactive. We need to, to do testing on that, and we need to go according to this law that requires that the, it's monitored. There's laws for the transportation. There's nothing here about protecting the worker, by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, so according to IDNR law 420 ILCS, Will you require that this is strictly followed, or are you going to look the other way? And will the produced water be monitored according to 420 IL CS20? Because if everything is followed in here, there's probably not going to be much fracking. And that's a little judgmental, but just read the law, and you'll see how they're not going to follow it. Oh, okay. Uh, 420 IL CS, what, do you know what, is that the... Fracking statute? No, it's a low-level radioactive waste. Okay. Statute. Yeah. Um, well, I, I can't speak on behalf of the department since I'm no longer a department employee. Uh -huh. uh, and that's not a, a cop-out. That's just I no longer work for the department. Um, but uh, the department has to follow the statute as it sets out. 
the guidance of the legislature. Uh, if there's a change that you think should be made, then uh, you should go back to the legislature and urge them to make that change. But the department has to follow the law and the regulatory process set out in the law. So if that requires, which it does, testing Which law? The <laughs> one that's existing for the low-level radioactive waste or the... They're both laws. They're well, both the, 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 the law that's guiding the, the department's decision for hydraulic fracturing is the fracturing statute. If, uh, if another law requires testing of another material, and, and regarding radioactivity, the department is not the one who deals with nuclear issues and radioactivity. That's the only uh, emergency management agency. So you two different agencies on, on these issues. Um, but I, I can't speak for the department. And are, I, they, are they involved? Is IEMA involved in the process of developing the rules, Mike? Uh, I, I, I do not know. I do not know. I'm not, in, I'm not writing the rules. And I no longer work with the department. Okay. Uh, but I do know other state agencies have been consulted in the rulemaking process because the department is, you know, we rely on our sister agencies, just like we're, DNR relies on ELA EPA, Department of Public Health, Department of Public Transportation for components of the bill. So we are relying on other state agencies, but I can't say which exactly ones have been consulted or not. Does the regulatory bill address this? Does the regulatory bill address radioactivity? Low-level radioactive waste. It, well, it requires uh, radioactive. Te it requires testing of uh, of the flowback. But not the produced. And the produced one is the one that's radioactive. Well, like I said, the the statute guides the department's regulatory authority. Okay, let's go by. let's go ahead and move on to the next question, please. Uh, maybe someone covered this earlier, but I was wondering, have any chemicals used in fracking around the country been banned or discontinued? And secondly, in Illinois, you said companies have to produce a list to you. Is there going to be anyone actually on site to see if those are exactly the chemicals they are using, or is there a way for them to use something that they haven't put on their list? So you're asking at first if, if any other chemicals have been banned nationwide. Uh, I, off the top of my head, I can't answer that. Um, I don't know what specifically other states have banned or not banned in that respect. Diesel. Diesel. Well, and diesel is banned, according to the statute. Diesel hmm? is banned. Can't hear you. Oh. It's just closer to your mouth. Okay, sorry. Diesel is banned by the statute. So diesel cannot be used. Um, you also can't do an uh, injection into fresh water. That's also prohibited. Um, in terms of what chemicals they will use and whether we know that they're actually using those, if they, report, if they report false information or don't follow the statute, they are subject to the penalties of the statute, including, and I forgot to mention this earlier when we were talking about civil and criminal penalties, the department also has the authority to revoke or suspend or deny a permit. She has a verification. Right, who's going to check on? Well, I mean, the, the, the department has inspectors, so we will have inspectors going out to the sites. Also, since there is a, a, a complaint, essentially a complaint mechanism, if a citizen has reason to believe something is not being followed, report that to us. Citizens aren't allowed on location. Well, I, well I, even I if... Do this for a living. They're not allowed sure, on and I understand that. But if you hear something or you think something, you can report that to DNR. Yeah, and in most cases now, we... having the regulator sitting there making sure what's going down hall or not, they don't have that either. The only time that a, that a representative from a state is allowed on location is for cementing purposes only. Actually, the legislation gives the department the authority to enter the site at any point. So you'll, have, you'll be able to do both cementing and fracture? Correct. What about acidizing, which ah. is completely different from fracture? Uh, I can't comment on the for acidizing. I'm not as familiar with it. But that, does, that is not to say the people at the department are not. I'm not a technical expert. Those experts who are in, division are, are, in our division are new office of oil and gas which was just split off from the Office of Mines and Minerals. So they would have knowledge of that that I wouldn't have. So I, I can't comment on the acidization. Okay. We have time for one last question, and we're going to take it from over here, please. Okay. Um, I, uh, there's a couple of questions. I actually have a couple of questions. But let me go to the first one, the real big one, and that is the earthquake issue. Um, Mike, we came to you and we gave you a bunch of experts that we have found from across the country that are extremely concerned about fracking and the use of Class II wells in the New Madrid earthquake zone and the Wabash Valley earthquake zone 
The most, the most unstable earthquake zones east of the Rockies, that's right where they're headed with a lot of this fracking. And there are seismologists around the country that are saying that, whoa, we need some science around this because it's not just how fast you push the water into the class two injection well, but it's actually slicking up the whole fracture zone. And that even years later, an earthquake wave from a large earthquake distant from us could actually set off a large-scale earthquake because of all of this slick water. We asked you to contact Nicholas Evandrelst from, the, um, from Columbia University and Dr. Hamburger from Indiana University, the world premier expert on the Wabash Valley earthquake zone. And I had just talked to them just two days ago and nobody from the IDNR or the Illinois Geologic Survey has contacted the absolute experts on this issue. What is going on. Are you guys going to be looking at this? It is in your purview in three places in the bill. The DNR has wide latitude to make the rules and regulations so that the process is safe for Illinois. Are you going to be looking at the issue of uh, seismicity in a real, honest, scientific way? Uh, okay. Uh, first, I did provide those names to our technical staff. I don't know what they did with them. Uh, second of all, the bill does have seismicity language. I, I know it doesn't meet muster with some, some, uh, some organizations and some people. Uh, well, we did, in crafting the bill, we did consult with the uh, State Geological Survey. And they uh, helped us write that language. They helped put together that language. Um, they are the state's uh, source for geological information. And uh, I understand if some people don't uh, think they, they might not be credible or they might not have accurate information. Sure, sorry. Uh, in drafting the bill, uh, we did consult, we, and I mean the negotiating partners, did consult with the State Geological Survey. And they helped draft the seismicity language. And I wasn't able to mention it earlier, but the seismicity language basically says if there's a seismic event and it can be traced to a, a fracking operation, then the department, through a rulemaking process, will have the authority to essentially establish a, uh, uh, what's it called, a, a stoplight system. So uh, green or red, the department can tell the uh, class two injection will to shut down or not shut down. Um, and that was negotiated and put together by the State Geological Survey. Um, I understand you have your experts, but they are the state's geological experts. And you may disagree with that, but they helped us put that together. Any other comments? Okay. Um, I'd like to um, end the formal part of the discussion now. We're absolutely out of time. I want to thank you all for coming out on a Saturday afternoon to join us. And especially I want to thank our panelists for being here today.